Hello and welcome to episode four of our continuing study of just one of my favorite wisdom books, and that is, of course, the Tao Te Ching. In the Stephen Mitchell translation from HarperCollins, this is a very short book, 81 little poems, 81 little verses, here's two of them right here, uh, written 25 centuries ago in ancient China by a legendary figure called Lao Tzu. We're not really sure if he's, if he's real or kind of a just a legend, but the book is real because I got it right here in my hands. And we've been going through in these first videos through the first 50 chapters of the 81 chapters, and we got a little ways to go. But I think, I think the book is doing its work, you know, as we listen to or as we read through these passages together. Um, there's, a, there's a kind of subtle and difficult to define accumulation, like a tiny trickle uh, behind a dam, and the lake just keeps getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And so I think there's a cumulative effect to these amazing little poems. So I'm going to um, start up with chapter 53, and we'll go from there. The great way is easy, yet people prefer the side paths. Be aware when things are out of balance. Stay centered within the Tao. When rich speculators prosper while farmers lose their land, when government officials spend money on weapons instead of cures, when the upper class is extravagant and irresponsible while the poor have nowhere to turn, all this is robbery and chaos. It is not in keeping with the Tao. Mm, a little socio-political commentary from 25 centuries ago. Sounds like it was from today's paper. I love that first line, the great way is easy, yet people prefer the side paths. There's one of my favorite lines from the Gospels. I think it's in Matthew where Jesus says, uh, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy. By the way, yoke is etymologically linked to the word yoga. In, in Sanskrit. So the whole idea of yoke or yoga or way, you know, it's, it's, these are all images drawn from our real lives that are trying to convey something about process, about method, about how we get from here to there. And, and maybe we're making it too hard. And that's why it says here, the great way is easy. So that's chapter 53. Here's chapter 54. Whoever is planted in the Tao will not be rooted up. Whoever embraces the Tao will not slip away. Her name will be held in honor from generation to generation. Let the Tao be present in your life and you will become genuine. Let it be present in your family and your family will flourish. Let it be present in your country, and your country will be an example to all countries in the world. Let it be present in the universe, and the universe will sing. How do I know this is true? By looking inside myself. Didn't he, didn't he end one of the earlier chapters that same exact way? It's beautiful. Chapter 56 one of the famous couplets in the entire Tao Te Ching, sometimes translated as those who say don't know and those who know don't say. Here in the Stephen Mitchell translation, here's how he did it. Those who know don't talk. Those who talk don't know. Close your mouth, block off your senses, blunt your sharpness, untie your knots, soften your glare, settle your dust. This is the primal identity. Be like the Tao. It can't be approached or withdrawn from, benefited or harmed, honored or brought into disgrace. It gives itself up continually. That is why it endures. Those who know don't talk and those who talk don't know. 
he's got a sense of humor, this Lao Tzu, and a way with words. It, it's, it's, it's pithy and so potent and so evocative. And I think we instantly recognize what he means, that you know, the people doing the most talking about whatever subject it is are very often the people who know the least about it. And when you really deepen into a lived, what's the word in this passage, uh, or as the previous chapter, genuine, people who really become genuine and authentic, they get quieter and quieter. They just show up in action. They don't have much to say because they know that you can't encapsulate anything important with words. Words are just tools to help us like get stuff done. But when it comes to talking about Tao, all we have left is poetry. Like, like the poetry of the Tao Te Ching. Chapter 57. If you want to be a great leader, you must first, you must learn to follow the Tao. Stop trying to control. Let go of fixed plans and concepts and the world will govern itself. The more prohibitions you have, the less virtuous people will be. The more weapons you have, the less secure people will be. The more subsidies you have, the less self-reliant people will be. Therefore, the master says, I let go of the law and people become honest. I let go of economics and people become prosperous. I let go of religion and people become serene. I let go of all desire for the common good and the good becomes common as grass. Through and through these chapters, there is the sense of the wisdom of allowance, the wisdom of letting the river go where it's going to go and cooperating with that. Um, the more prohibitions you have, the less virtuous people will be. Every time you write a law, you invent a new category of law breaking. And again, as we discussed in an earlier video, is this politically naive? Is it? Is it, is, it like, is it like the libertarianism of every 15-year-old boy who first read Ayn Rand and is like, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's, it's all of the above. And that's what makes the, the Taoist literature so provocative. This isn't a constitution or a contract or a declaration. It's, it's, it's again, it's a series of provocations. F Chapter 58, more about government and governance. If a country is governed with tolerance, the people are comfortable and honest. If a country is governed with repression, the people are depressed and crafty. When the will to power is in charge, the higher the ideals, the lower the results. Try to make people happy and you lay the groundwork for vice. Try to make people moral. Sorry, I blew that. Try to make people happy and you lay the groundwork for misery. That's better. Try to make people moral and you lay the groundwork for vice. You know, I'm thinking of when they passed pro prohibition and they actually amended the constitution here in the United States to outlaw liquor back in the 1920s. And instantly a criminal enterprise was born around the importation and smuggling of alcohol. And alcohol was every bit as, av as available as before prohibition. But now you created this entire criminal enterprise, and a criminal class that lasted far longer than uh, prohibition did. So that is not a bad way to put it, you know, that um, when you try to inhibit something, when you try to make people moral, you lay the groundwork for vice. It's, it's very interesting political observation. Chapter 59. For governing a country well, there is nothing better than moderation. The mark of a moderate man is freedom from his own ideas. There's something you can tweet. The mark of a moderate man is freedom from his own ideas. What a beautiful philosophical virtue that is. To go on, tolerant like the sky, 
all pervading like sunlight, firm like a mountain, supple like a tree in the wind. He has no destination in view and makes use of anything life, life happens to bring his way. Nothing is impossible for him because he has let go. He can care for the people's welfare as a mother cares for a child. Verse 60. This is one of the this is also one of the most famous lines from the Dao Te Ching, often cited on libertarian blogs, <laughs> by the way. Governing a large country is like frying a small fish. You spoil it with too much poking. <laughs> nice kitchen analogy here. I don't know if you do a lot of cooking, but when you cook fish, there's a couple things you should know. It it's over very quickly. And the less you touch it, the better. Like one flip, and that's it. You don't flip it over six times. Non-interference. Let it happen. To go on. Center your country in the Tao, and evil will have no power. Not that it isn't there, but you'll be able to step out of its way. Give evil nothing to oppose, and it will disappear itself. Mm. We could do a whole hour on those on that last couplet. You know that saying, what you resist persists. When you push on something, it has to get stronger to push back. And instead, Lao Tzu is suggesting, just get out of the way. Give it nothing to push against, and it will just sort of, <laughs> you know, weaken and wither on its own. It's an interesting observation that could be applied in personal relationships in the political realm, all kinds of different places. Jumping over to chapter 63. Act without doing. Work without effort. Think of the small as large and the few as many. Confront the difficult while it is still easy. Accomplish the great task by a series of small acts. The master never reaches for the great, thus she achieves greatness. When she runs into a difficulty, she stops and gives herself to it. She doesn't cling to her own comfort, thus problems are no problem for her. I feel like the Tao Te Ching is the kind of book I should just keep on my bed, keep on my nightstand and just read over and over and over and over again. Here's chapter 64. What is, what is rooted is easy to nourish. What is recent is easy to correct. What is brittle is easy to break. What is small is easy to scatter. Prevent trouble before it arises. Put things in order before they exist. The giant pine tree grows from a tiny sprout. The journey of a thousand miles starts from beneath your feet. Talk about good fortune cookies. We were talking about fortune cookies in an earlier video. When they used to be cool, they used to say stuff like that. The journey of a thousand miles starts from beneath your feet. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean to say the giant pine tree grows from a tiny sprout? It means enjoy where you are, enjoy the process. Stop fixating on the end and that you're not there yet. Stop fixating that you haven't published your book yet. Instead, just write the best sentence you know how to write because the sentence is the root of the paragraph and the paragraph is the root of the chapter and the chapter is the root of the book. Do what you can do where you are with what you have now. The journey of a thousand miles begins with one step. And so take three steps a day, and in a week you've taken 21 steps, and a month you've taken 84 steps, and in a year you've taken, get out your calculator, and in three years you've got a hell of a lot of distance under your feet. But we forget that. We're so fixated on outcomes and end results. He goes on, I love this chapter 64, he goes on, rushing into action you fail, trying to grasp things you lose them. Forcing a project to completion, you ruin what was almost ripe. Therefore, the master takes action by letting things take their course. 
He remains as calm at the end as at the beginning. He has nothing, thus he has nothing to lose. What he desires is non-desire. What he learns is to unlearn. He simply reminds people of who they have always been. He cares about nothing but the Tao, thus he can care for all things. Hmm. I sometimes think if chapter 64 were the only chapter that survived all these centuries from the Tao Te Ching, the Tao Te Ching would still be famous, important, and totally awesome. Chapter 65. The ancient masters didn't try to educate the people, but kindly taught them to not know. When they think that they know the answers, people are difficult to guide. When they know that they don't know, people can find their own way. If you want to learn how to govern, avoid being clever or rich. The simplest pattern is the clearest. Content with an ordinary life, you can show all people the way back to their own true nature. I think of the current Pope, Pope Francis, who when he moved to the Vatican, refused to live in the Pope's opulent apartment, lives in a regular apartment with other priests, doesn't ride around in a limousine, gets a regular car when he goes out. The first, his first day in Rome, he got on the ground with a bucket of water and washed a bunch of people's feet, people from the local prison, Muslims, Jews, atheists, no other non-believers. Servant leadership, humbling yourself. I remember when Governor Jerry Brown here in my state of California first got to office back in the 1970s. He wouldn't live in the, he wouldn't live in the governor's mansion. He lived in a tiny apartment. Um, th this is that kind of her servant leadership that is being pointed out as a virtue here in chapter 65. I'm, I'm just so, there's current, so many current events leap to mind when I hear these lines. When they think that they know the answers, people are difficult to guide. I think about all the fake news and bad information around vaccines, around uh election security around around any hot button issue you care to mention guns and gun safety and gun regulation and all these like really contentious political and social justice issues um everybody has access to their own websites their own news outlets and their own facts and so when people think they that they know the answers they are difficult to guide um, yeah, I could just go down a whole rabbit hole here about truthiness and about propaganda, but I don't need to preach about that. You all see what I'm seeing. That's one of the many ways that the Tao Te Ching really touches into the perennial problems of being human. Doesn't matter what century you drop this book into, it's going to speak to the conditions and challenges of that century as it certainly is now for us here in our century. Just a few more here, and we'll wrap up this uh, fourth video. Chapter 66, all streams flow to the sea because it is lower than they are. Humility gives it power. Let me pause. There's that idea of yin again. Yin is the low, you know, the valley. Yang is the mountain, the high. So why is the ocean the most powerful body of water on earth? Because it's the lowest, it's, it's the biggest space, it's the biggest openness, it's the lowest hole. And so it doesn't have to go looking for water, all the water comes to it. And thus it becomes the mightiest body of water on earth, controlling climate, the source of life, everything the ocean does. It's a beautiful, beautiful metaphor. I'll read the passage again, chapter 66. All streams flow to the sea because it is lower than they are. Humility gives it its power. If you want to govern the people, you must place yourself below them. If you want to lead the people, you must learn how to follow them.
The master is above the people and no one feels oppressed. She goes ahead of the people and no one feels manipulated. The whole world is grateful to her because she competes with no one. No one can compete with her. She's just not competing. <laughs> One last chapter and then we'll wrap up this video. Chapter 67, he says, some say that my teaching is nonsense. Others call it lofty, but impractical. But to those who have looked inside themselves, this nonsense makes perfect sense. And to those who put it into practice, this loftiness has roots that go deep. I have just three things to teach, he writes. Simplicity, patience, compassion. These three are your greatest treasures. Simple in action and in thoughts, you return to the source of being. Patient with both friends and enemies, you accord with the way things are. Compassionate toward yourself, you reconcile all beings in the world. So he's already anticipating, isn't he, that people will push back on the teachings of Taoism as, oh, that's that's really, you know, that's that's just not well. The first criticism he addresses is, well, that's just garbage. That's nonsense. I don't know what you're talking about. It's a bunch of con contradictions. Get it out of here. The second criticism he addresses is people who sort of admire it but say, well, it's very lofty, but it'll never work. It's impractical. But then he sort of says, you know what? It's neither ridiculous or impractical. If you put it into practice, by looking deep inside yourself, all this nonsense makes perfect sense. And this loftiness has roots that go deep. Boil it all down to those three words. Simplicity, patience, and compassion. And you've got it. And this is the perennial wisdom of Taoism, isn't it? This is exactly what we learned from the Sufis in Islam, from Muhammad, from, from the Talmud, from Jewish wisdom, from the Gospels of Jesus, from Buddha, of Buddhism. The perennial wisdom of letting go of the illusion that I am egoically in control of anything and instead surrendering into the flow of the Tao what Christians might call the Holy Spirit or the will of God or, or in a word, grace. And that as Paul wrote in his letters in the New Testament, when we come into this experience, we will experience a peace that surpasses all understanding. The mind isn't gonna get this, but the heart knows. And that's where we'll leave you with episode four of our study of the Tao Te Ching. Still have episode five to come. I've got another 10 or so chapters I wanna share with you. So join us on the other side of our study of the Tao Te Ching.